Are you all set, Bob? Take it away in full spectrum color. Well, Doug, first I'd like to say this, that I feel doubly honored to have been chosen to be the first one involved in our big change because there are so many much more colorful characters around here than this reporter. Dinosaurs. Everyone knows what they look like, to some extent. The problem with drawing any extinct animal is that there is a lot of estimation, assumption, and educated guesswork involved to figure out what the animal actually looked like. Things like height, posture, chunkiness, whether or not they have lips, and of course, their colour. Until nearly two decades ago, we didn't have any evidence of the colours of dinosaurs, and our hypotheses extended to, hey, they kinda look like lizards or birds, so maybe they have colours like lizards and birds? Either way, we've finally been able to get an idea of the colours of some dinosaurs and other extinct species, and to figure out how, let's explore the world of colour and how it's created. Now, I know we're all here to talk about dinosaurs, but to truly understand how we figure out dinosaur coloration, it's actually best to understand the colors of modern life first and get ready to get granular. Let's start with one color to make it easy. Green. You might remember in high school learning about plant cells. And if you did, you may recall that chlorophyll is the part of a plant cell that reflects green light and absorbs the rest. So it appears to our human eyes as the color green. In case you don't remember, let's very briefly take it back to level one chem. First, white light, which is a combination of all of the colors of the rainbow, hits something, and then some wavelengths from the white light get absorbed by that thing, and whatever wavelengths aren't absorbed get reflected back, some of which will get into your eyes, which your brain then registers as a color. Now, wavelengths, which is quite literally the length of each wave of light, are associated with different colors, and they are measured in nanometers. So a wavelength of, say, 700 nanometers will appear to us as red, 500 as green, and 400 as purple. And you can fill in the rest of the rainbow from here. So in the case of plants and their chlorophyll leaves, we know that they absorb every wavelength of light except green, the 500 nanometer wavelength, which then gets reflected, allowing us to see the reflected wavelength as green. I'm realizing now that I'm using green to describe how we see color when red-green colorblindness is the most common colorblindness in humans, but I'm hoping everyone watching will forgive me. <laughs> now that everyone in the audience is up to date with colors, let's look at basic coloration on animals, starting with mammals. Now mammals don't have chlorophyll, that isn't how we get our coloration. It's also why people aren't green, so instead we use a different organelle in our cells, melanosomes. Melanosomes, remember that word because they will be on the test, are found in animal cells, and it's the part that is in charge of melanin, something that you may already have heard of. Melanin is the most common light-absorbing pigment in the animal kingdom, and it's the reason why humans, as well as other mammals, come in various shades. These melanosomes contain two kinds of melanin, which, depending on a few factors, such as density and arrangement, will reflect different amounts of each colored light. These pigments are eumelanin, which works on a spectrum of black and brown, and pheomelanin, which operates on a spectrum of yellow and red. Mammals may use these colorations for camouflage in order to blend in with their environment, or on a similar path, they may use it for mimicry, which is when an animal pretends to look like something else. For example, there is a theory that cheetah cubs have adapted a stripe of white fur down their back to make them look similar to the notoriously aggressive honey badger in order to confuse potential predators from a distance. There's also a common phenomenon in mammal colors known as countershading, where an animal evolves lighter colors on the bottom with darker fur on top. There are a few theories around this, one of which is that this actually balances out their color, as the light from the sun hits the top and lightens the dark color on the animal. At the same time, this shades the bottom of the animal, darkening those lighter colors, potentially making the animal one full color, standing out less to predators. 
Most mammals get their coloration from these pigments, like melanin. But you may have heard a fun fact once upon a time about polar bears not actually being white. Well, not technically true, because anything that reflects all wavelengths of white and appears as white is just white. The point that these people are trying to make is that the polar bear fur is actually transparent. In fact, the skin of a polar bear is actually black. You see, the polar bear has two layers of fur, both of which are transparent, which scatters and reflects all visible light, appearing to us as white, the combination of all colors that are being reflected, while still allowing UV light, which humans can't see, to pass through the fur and be absorbed by the black skin underneath, helping heat the bear. This is another means of producing color that is not entirely based on pigments like melanin called structural coloration. Structural coloration is pretty rare in mammals, but in other animals, it really opens up the rainbow. You may have heard of the PRISM experiment conducted by Sir Isaac Newton, or maybe you just like Pink Floyd. Either way, you're probably aware that light can be split to create a broad spectrum of wavelengths. Some animals have kinds of photonic microstructures that operate in similar ways to that glass prism to create structural coloration as opposed to the pigment coloration that we've already looked at. These more physical interactions with light come in a bunch of different forms. And birds and other animals like fish and reptiles will use these forms of light bending and light breaking structures to create colorful appearances. Their feathers or their scales refract the light and then bounce it around a bit to isolate particularly beautiful colors or create iridescent sheens where the color changes depending on the angle that you're viewing the animal from or where you are in relation to the light. These structures are fantastic to look at and they usually operate alongside pigments like melanins that we were talking about earlier. But look outside of mammals, you start to get some brand new pigments. Birds, as well as other animals, do have melanins, but also commonly have carotenoids, another kind of pigment which comes in yellow, orange, red, and purple. Its name comes from carotene, which was first isolated in carrots and carotenoids are the pigments that create this warm orange in both carrots and in pumpkins. You may have heard about flamingos getting their color from the foods that they eat, and this is true. They eat carotenoid-rich foods like brine shrimp and some algae, which then gets deposited in their feathers and creates this rich pinky orange hue. While melanin and carotenoids are the most common pigments in the animal kingdom, some birds, reptiles, fish, amphibians, and a bunch of invertebrates will use a heck of a lot more as well. Like Cytacophulvans, which are produced only by parrots, and is responsible for the red, yellow, and orange in several parrot species. Cytaco actually means parrot, and you can expect any animal with reference to Cytaco to be super colorful. You can quote me on that. A heart speed to the city street. There are actually a few pigments that are used by only a select few animals, and just to look a different color. Turacos and their close relatives use Turacin and Turacoverdin to create red and green, with the word verde referenced in Turacoverdin, which of course means green, not yummy sauce, as a co-worker recently pointed out to me. Fireflies and some other small animals produce luciferin, which makes them glow. Lucifer, of course, meaning bearer of light. It doesn't mean that these bugs have taken Satan into their hearts. Yet. Another one that makes animals glow is porphyrins, but this is actually a part of hemoglobin and blood, so a bunch of animals have porphyrins, including us, but not for the purposes of color. Porphyrins glow, but they only glow under intense UV light, which is one of the many reasons why a UV light may be used by crime scene investigators because it makes the porphyrin in our blood glow and make blood stains stand out. But back on topic here, the most common pigments across all animals are still melanins, which as we know, are housed in melanosomes. And remember that term because it's going to be on the test. 
Nearly two decades ago, a researcher made a discovery that opened up a whole world of color that we did not expect to be able to find. A world where we could determine color from some fossils. So here we are, only 10 minutes in and we're finally talking about the thing the title of the video says. Extinct animals, such as non-avian dinosaurs, seem to have used a lot of the same pigments that animals use today. This included ancient squid, and this researcher discovered something in the fossilized remains of a squid's ink sac, an organelle named, and for the A plus on this test, say it with me folks, melanosomes. It turns out you can sometimes find melanosomes in fossilized remains, and to this extent, if we can get enough fossilized evidence, we can compare the pigments of extinct animals to modern animals, whose melanosomes may be the same or similar size and arrangement. On top of this, if we can figure out how these structures were placed together, we can make educated guesses about structural coloration as well. Thus far, we've been able to find evidence of coloration mostly in the feathered dinosaurs, and then compared them to our modern dinosaurs, which, as it turns out, also have feathers. Birds. In 1996, we uncovered the first evidence of feathered dinosaurs. I, I say we as if I was there, but I hadn't been born yet. These feathers were less like bird feathers, and seemed to be more for insulation than flight. This dinosaur was named Cynosauropteryx. Researchers studied the melanosomes of these fluffy creatures, and here we are, with a very red panda looking dinosaur. The Anchionis, Anchi, Anchior, Anchionis is another feathered dinosaur that we've determined some interesting colors from, with a gray and black coat. What's interesting about this specimen is that one out of two of the Anchionis individuals that have been studied seems to have a red crest, while the other doesn't. And while this could mean that one of these two studies is either missing evidence or misinterpreted something somewhere, we could also be looking at a case of sexual dimorphism, which is when males and females of a species evolve different appearances. And if we make assumptions based on modern birds, it could be the case that male Angionis had head crests. But again, this is all educated guesswork at the moment, it seems that at least three species of dinosaur actually had iridescent feathers, the effect where the animal's color looks different depending on the angle of the lighting. The Kai Hong, for example, which is Mandarin for rainbow, seems to have nanostructures like modern trumpeters, which are birds from South America with iridescent chest feathers. We've also found colors of some extinct birds, like the Inkayasu, a type of extinct penguin from the Eocene that was sort of gray with reddish feathers somewhere. We've looked at the skin of dinosaurs as well, not just feathers. The Cytacosaurus was probably just brown, which... Look, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. The city we began it does show evidence of countershading though, which I spoke about earlier, where the belly is lighter than the back. Interesting to know that it's not just modern animals with this coloration. It's important here to take note that with some of these illustrations I'm presenting on screen, there is still some guesswork about the exact patterning, as we're pretty sure of the colors of these animals, but sometimes where the colors sit on the animals can be more of a mystery. Maybe one day we'll know more about how the rest of these dinosaurs looked. There is a part of me that's a little torn about this though. Ben the dinosaur nerd is stoked that we can figure out such interesting details like this, but Ben the artist is a little sad. Where we initially drew dinosaurs in these drab colors because we thought they were related to monitor lizards or crocodiles, turned out that we could explore hypothetical options that were just completely unique patterns that we as artists invented ourselves or based on some modern animal. But now, as we discover more colors of dinosaurs, we could find out that hadrosaurs, like the discovery from the Peabody Museum of Natural History, were probably just gray like a rhino, which makes sense for large herbivores, but where is the spice? Hopefully as we explore we find a healthy mix of colors that reflects our modern range of animal colorations, and we can continue to use our shared imaginations of the extinct species that we don't know about to create some crazy color schemes. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Ben the Quasi-Ecologist, this is the Natural World Explored, and until next time, stay curious friends. 
and then compared them to our modern dinosaurs, which, as it turns out, also have feathers. Birdies. <laughs> mm. No, 